I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my perspective on infrastructure monitoring and try to um, motivate uh, the, the activity, uh, throw out some, uh, some difficulties we've had. Uh, I've got Trevor in the audience, uh, Trevor Burbridge, who's uh, uh, in charge of the research team um, uh, that, that does a lot of this work. And uh, so Trevor's here to keep me honest. Uh, so if he starts uh, waving and talking, then, then we'll know that uh, uh, I've said something that isn't entirely accurate. And, and also you can talk to him over coffee and find out the real truth. Um, so I'll go, I'll go through. And, and feel free, uh, you know, we're, this is a good group size. Feel free to, to, to stop me at any point. Just, just uh, challenge anything. Let's talk about um, what I'm saying as I say it. Okay, so I'll just introduce who I am and where I'm from. Uh, I'm Simon Thompson. I run, as Wisey said, the Big Data and Customer Experience Research Practice at BT Research. Um, we're a global company in BT. We, we have a, a, a legal presence in 180 countries around the world, uh, over 24 billion in revenue, um, and uh, uh, around about 100,000 people work for BT. And we have an extensive network of uh, research and development uh, partnerships uh, and, uh, and labs. And of course, we can't do uh, geospatial uh, reasoning, as you can see from that chart. Um, but uh, it's representative of the stuff we've got. So uh, we, uh, we have, for instance, an en uh, a research uh, collaboration in Belfast, an innovation center there with University of Ulster and uh, other, other collaborating universities in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, we have um, a, a presence at MIT, and we have a number of research pro uh, partnerships at MIT. Uh, we have uh, a presence at Tsinghua University in China, uh, and we have a lab uh, in the Middle East, uh, the Etisalat BT Innovation Center. So we collaborate with Etisalat, who are the regional telco in, in uh, uh, Abu Dhabi and uh, the, the Gulf there. So that's the scope of the company. And our, uh, our objective is to bring purposeful innovation uh, into communication systems. And our history uh, goes back a long way. That's Wheatstone and Croft, uh, who uh, founded uh, the Electrical Telegraph Company. In Well, in fact, Mr. Croft founded the Electrical Telephone Co Company in 1846. And he bought, he bought Mr. Wheatstone, Mr. Wheatstone's patents to do that. Wheatstone and Croft actually co-filed some patents, and Croft then, they had a row, and Croft bought them out. Um, interestingly, the money that Mr. Wheatstone got, he also invented the Wheatstone Bridge, so you'll be familiar with that from physics, but the money he got from selling his telegraph patents, he used some of it to um, sponsor uh, Ada Lovelace to translate uh, a lecture that an Italian academic had given about the difference engine uh, to, uh, in, into English, and uh, this was the paper that caused Ada uh, to think about the nonsense she was reading in this lecture and to actually formalize it and to write a program. And uh, so Ada was paid, paid for from uh, the booty gained by setting up BT as was in 1846. Of course, many things have happened to us since then. Um, but uh, it's an interesting piece of history. Of course, another piece of history I should mention is that um, it was post office engineering that provided the technical uh, design capability to create the Colossus computer, and uh, Tommy Flowers was a post office engineer, and he built the, the Colossus computer uh, for the Bletchley uh, code breakers as well. So there we are. Uh, so, right, monitoring, monitoring infrastructure. And I, I have a, a, a nice motivational example, a very real example of the kind of stuff we do. Um, and this comes out of Trevor's group. And uh, this is a, a, real, um, a, a real pipeline, hugely simplified, where we uh, uh, monitor the UK access network for um, uh, 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 XDSL broadband, OK? Uh, so. XDSL broadband is the, um, uh, the super fast product uh, that goes up to about 76 megabits per second. Uh, and uh, this is delivered over the uh, copper wire from the, um, the DSLAM, the, the green boxes you see round on the streets. And we connect the, 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 the green boxes up to uh, 
up with fiber optics back to the uh, branch office, as we call it, or the exchange building. And then there's a, an optical backbone that goes into the, the main office infrastructure. And I'll, I, I've got some more detail on that. So simpli simplified, you know, this is, this is your, the broadband network. And the bit we're actually monitoring is the bit from the branch office out to uh, the um, uh, out to the premises, right? So we're, we're basically looking at the. In fact, that's not true. It's really it's the bit from the DSLAM to the uh, to the to the uh, the premises. So we're looking at an infrastructure with about seven million um, uh, devices uh, uh, reporting every quarter of an hour. Um, and we, we basically we bring that all together along with inventory information and line biography information. So what's happened to the line? When, is it, when has it happened? Who made what? When, you know, which, which type of device is this? We bring that together, uh, symbolized by this cubic structure here, um, although that's subsequently now, that was, that was what I built when I first did this. I, be, I built it as a data cube. Um, uh, the guys who work for Trevor have subsequently taken that away and, and, and pushed me out of the picture, and they've, they, they've done something rather saner <laughs> since. And in fact, this is a lot of work has been to actually uh, work out the, the right set of intermediate structures uh, to, um, uh, to bring together the, 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 the data from the inventory and the line biography. Uh, with the telemetry information, which is reported every 15 minutes, and the various types of telemetry information as well. So we have a range of things that the lines are reporting on. So they report on uh, the, uh, the attenuation of the signal through, through the frequency band uh, that's transmitted to them. Uh, they report on the noise on the line. They report on uh, events. Have I blown up? You know this kind of thing, and we 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 and a lot more as well, and we 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 use those in in various different ways, and and the outcome of this is that when we put it all together, we can use this in a range of applications. This is a silly one, which is a thunderstorm detector. Uh, we can use this to detect thunderstorms. Of course, thunderstorms have a large impact on it as well, which is why we can detect them. Uh, but yes. Yes, uh, it's, it's the lightning. When, whenever, you, whenever there's a lightning event, uh, then, then the, the uh, copper network responds, okay, in various ways. Yeah, yes, well, it's, it's, it's reset events, uh, it's power failures, uh, it's, it's attenuations, it's noise events. There are a number of ways that, that uh, the, the network will respond because the air is filled with signal at that point because of, you know, radio from the lightning. And um, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly what, what the, uh, the data that, that, that Andrew aggregated together to produce this GIF was. But I, I have a feeling it's uh, reset events, uh, uh, you know, correlated with the, with the lightning storm. Yeah? OK. Got a quick question. So that GIF, you've got a 10 highlight you're saying it's thunderous. Yes, well, it's lightning, really. It's lightning, yeah. it's thunderous. Yes. No, no, because because we know. <laughs> that's why I said. That's why I said it's a silly example. Yeah, no, uh, you know, it's essentially it's quite clear there has been a, a, a lightning storm uh, that's happened um, years ago. There was there was debate about what the impact of that would would be, but uh, like all data science. Uh, you know, the very obvious stuff immediately just becomes part of the, the general knowledge of the, of the people working on the system. So there isn't, there's no debate now about, about the impact of, of lightning. And really, what, what we just do is we design, uh, we design the network to be tolerant of it and to recover quickly from it. Okay, so there's a lot of work that's gone on to put uh, better electrical reset infrastructure out there, uh, better, better batteries. Um, uh, and, and, and better resilient steps to make it, uh, you know, less, less impactful when it happens as well. Okay, my, my directional question is possibly a long one. Um, what I kind of mean is, do you have anything that classifies that string of events as a thunderstorm, for example, or 
In, yes, right, and 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 this is this is the per, this is this top layer. Okay, so okay. so so what we what we do is we take the uh, as you'd expect, as you're saying, you know, just as any any sensible, hopefully semi-professional person would do. We take we take the data up, and the data is useless, right? The data the data data is fun and interesting, but really the the obvious, obviously the value uh, uh, appears. I was going to say comes from it appears here in these applications, and and uh, we did this deliberately. It's, it, this is, I think, a, a, a useful and important point. You know, when when we started off, we we knew what application we were after hydrating with the work, which was around what we call fault volume uh, reduction, which is essentially network uplift, right? And we knew that di by directing that based on the data picture, there was a good, rather than you know, reports from field engineers or this bit isn't working very well, we should do it, or this one's due for a replacement, right? But instead looking at the data and saying, what is broken here? What could we best spend our money on, right? Based on what's really happening. We believe there was a big opportunity to save money. And it turned out very quickly because we, we, we were able to use big data and we, we were able to tap into the, the, the sampling network, which we weren't, uh, back when this work started in 20, 2012, 2013, we weren't able to do at that stage. You know, it was on the cusp, that's why we were able to do the project. It turned out very quickly that was true, right? And as soon as we knew that was true, we were able to productionize this pipeline. And once it's productionized, I mean, it took a long time to actually get it into to production, there's still bits of it that are, that are not right now. But since it's been productionized, a whole range of other applications for the data have, have emerged, right? And, and these are sim symbolized here. Uh, the, the, the list is actually rather long, but the, you know, for instance, vendor management is a key one. We can see what's happening uh, to, with the data cut by the people who provide the boxes that are producing the data. And that enables us to understand when we're getting the right level of value out of out of the, the, the those contracts, right, and, and and to inform future decisions about what we should do, which is a very valuable application. The other one is ad hoc investigation exploration. It's a, uh, something that people often neglect. It's very hard to make a business case for it, but of course it brings enormous transparency to what's happening, and it prevents a lot of ill-founded work, which is why it's hard to make a case because. You can't really quantify what people haven't wasted their time on, but I believe it's an enormous value in this in this space. You know, stopping people flapping around based on mythology. Instead, you can see what's happening. Okay. Now, I, I think important thing just to quickly talk about. I'm spending a lot of time talking, so I'll try and skip through. It is important. One of the important things about infrastructure monitoring, I think, is that the reality of the delivery system that we're monitoring is a lot more complex than the bit we're monitoring, okay? So um, Trevor, in fact, has done a lot of work uh, uh, further down in the, uh, in the, uh, the, 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 the multi-service the multi -service layers, uh, probably up here, um, uh, looking at uh, the provision of the service to the access network, okay? But really what we did was to abstract away the existence of this complex underpinning system. And the other thing I, I, would, I would like to point out is that um, in our world, basically everything lies all the time. All the equipment lies all the time. And the, and the reason it lies, it's like that Bruce Springsteen song, uh, you know, Born in the USA. It, it lies because it's covering up. Um, so all the time, all the kit is trying to repair what's going on. And th this is good, right? This is, this is really helpful. Uh, uh, it, it, it caches up data. It, 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 uh, it goes back and it asks the data again when it's got lost. Um, uh, everything in the chain that produces the service on, on, on your PC is busily trying to repair a bad situation all the time. And of course, that conceals a lot of what's going on. And it, and it, it can make things look quite funny sometimes. Okay, so we'll go through this. Okay, I'll skip forward because I make these points. This, this is another, another thing that's interesting, I think, 
uh, in our context, which is that what we're actually often, well, what we're doing a lot is we're monitoring um, business as usual, almost all the time, that, that things are proceeding as normal. Uh, we have real challenges around peak events, and, and I think this is going to get profoundly worse because um, uh, at the minute our peak events are around media events, so, you know, the World Cup final or the Olympics, I've got another thing in here about the Olympics, um, where loads of people want to watch TV and TV has to be perfect and you can't store TV, live TV, you know, it has to be when they want to watch it for these sports events. Uh, it's not like Game of Thrones, it's... You know, people, people don't want to come back and watch it later in the evening. They want, they want to see it when it's on. Um, and, and, you know, for us, uh, managing these peaks is a key reason to, to monitor the infrastructure. But, of course, the, the business of usual monitoring system is ill-suited to doing this. And, and so we, we have a real problem about providing good enough monitoring for the events that really matter. Um, because we were basically set up to do the, 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 the boring stuff. And that's the Olympics again. Um, and, and this was from, uh, you know, this is a, a look to the future about our overall strategy, which is to do with uh, the, cog the cognitive part of the network. But I actually go through this again. So some key issues that I just want to run over. Um, a key issue is when things go missing in, in our data. And um, this can hit us in a couple of ways. One way is that we uh, don't realize that things are missing, and then uh, our view of the world is profoundly different from the reality of the world. Uh, and you know, an example here was in a particular network, a uh, very old network, we saw um, a systematic problem where uh, there were uh, lines that were being reported as failing. And uh, when we looked at the record, the life history of those lines, it actually looked like they, they, were, they were fine. Okay? And the reason it looked like they were fine was because the test network um, was stuck. And the reason it was stuck was because of 1976. So what had happened was... Um, things had got very hot. The baker light that was part of the testing network had become embrittled. Uh, over time, the use of these armatures, gradually some of them failed. Uh, some of them, when they failed, they failed by locking onto uh, the testing circuit, and then they reported uh, tests against an open circuit. And so the test came back positive. Uh, it, it just tested itself. It said, oh, this is great. Um, and that was completely hidden. And until we started looking at things from another dimension, we just, we just couldn't spot that. And as soon as we realized we spotted it and we ripped it all out and redone it all, but uh, that was a problem. Another one is, another similar situation is a drift of your knowledge of what's what you're trying to monitor and, and, and what is actually out there. And this was a situation that caught us out quite badly. We had um, a, a two systems, one which was operational and one which was the system of record. And we saw a problem where um, the, uh, the level of fault on the operational system stopped making any sense. And we, we couldn't understand why there were various populations of, fa of failure out there. Uh, and, and we simply couldn't unpick the root cause. And, and it turned out that the root cause was there was another system which was providing the inventory information for the operational system. And uh, the way it did that was by a pub sub a pub publish and subscribe protocol, right? So it would, it, it, the operational system sat and waited for an event uh, from the, uh, the, the mainframe uh, and, um, uh, and then wrote it into its own database, right? And uh, everybody who implements a pub publish subscribe protocol, I hope, realizes the thing is it's, they're not reliable. 
because the subscribers um, do other things sometimes. Uh, software isn't perfect, unfortunately. Uh, and, um, and so you, you get errors. And the designers of this system had completely understood that and, and acknowledged this in their design, and they'd built in a, a periodic synchronization uh, which, which uh, repaired the, the, the data table. So basically, periodically, the two systems would get together and say, oh, you know, we're mostly right, but there's a bit missing. Let's copy it over, and we'll get it right, and there we are, and we'll go on. And, and so it's synchronized. Unfortunately, in uh, cost-cutting uh, uh, activity, somebody decided that that synchronization was not needed, and what happened over time is that, oops, didn't do what I wanted. Oh, you can't see it. These have changed color. Um, sorry, it's too subtle. My, my, my shading's too subtle there. But um, essentially what happened was that, that gradually over a period of months, the, 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 the records drifted apart and the operational system uh, basically started to report the behavior of lines and accounts that were closed because it, it didn't know they were closed. And so suddenly the data set stopped making any sense. So that was a, a real problem for us. Um, OK, and, and the, the final thing, I've, I've already talked about this a bit. Um, you know, the, the thing is that the chain of custody of the data is very, very complex. And it tends to be made up of a, a, a set of systems that were not designed for the purposes of providing you with telemetry information. And so here, you know, we've got the there's in the green box, the cabinet, the DSLAM, we have a, a, a computer in there which stores data and it processes data and, and it produces reports. Okay, so it's looking after the data. It's producing the summary tables for itself and sending them on. We've got an element manager which is managing uh, the reports from a set of cabs and it aggregates it up. We've got an, a, a piece of operating uh, support system software, a, a, a server, which is then uh, taking the compressed results of, of the element managers and putting them together into, into a single unified view. And then we have to go through a staging infrastructure before we can import it onto our Hadoop cluster, right? And, and ingesting data into Hadoop clusters is a, a, a difficult thing. It's getting easier with every day. But, um, uh, you know, you obviously you have some latency and some issues with that. And um, unsurprisingly, we see problems where in the data pipeline things go wrong. And this results in entire chunks of infrastructure uh, failing to report from time to time. And this is due to different failures in different parts of this pipeline. And um, it does amuse me that, that I was reading the Google Machine Learning Handbook, and the first thing they say is, make sure your data pipeline is solid end to end. Um, and what I would say is, this never, ever happens. In fact, you have to regard your data pipeline as an enemy. Um, it's, this is an entirely adversarial situation. You can never trust your data pipeline. And also, worse than that, you can, you can never actually make it trusted because the way that the business cases stack up mean that it's just not going to happen. Um, basically, people will pay for applications, that, and, and the, the telemetry is piggybacking on the back of that, and we, we make the best of it. Um, and, and as I pointed out with the, 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 the synchronization issue, you can't, when you're building your test infrastructure over your data pipeline, everybody should test their data pipeline, obviously. Uh, but you can't uh, rely on cross-checking uh, because sometimes that's going to, to, to lead you astray. So I think this is an appeal to this community to think about data pipelines in Machiavellian uh, terms and adversarial terms and to try to help uh, the engineering community cope with this reality because it is a reality. The, the, the information we're gathering out of complex infrastructures is, is taken from uh, a, a, challenging, uh, a, a challenging system. It's not something that's just going to be perfected and produced. Okay, so. I think we're talking about things here which are not deliberately malicious regarding intending to, shall I say, bias the performance towards their end rather than being. Of course, you're, of course you're right, but, but actually I think it's better to construct it as deliberate, deliberate malice. Um, I mean, that's not a good idea when you're trying to work with people, but I think in terms of, 
when you're when you're setting out the 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 uh, the engineering to support the system, I think if you consider it as an adversarial situation, if you think about it, you know, if somebody was planning to derail us, what would they do, and where would it happen? I think that you can get into a much better situation, and that's that's why I'm saying it. So it's it's that it's that mindset about this this is going to lie to us all the time and it's going to find new and devilish ways to lie to us. How can we, how can we set ourselves up to cope with that reality? Um, and and th th those, those problems arise in all sorts of ways, you know, especially in a big enterprise, you have reorganizations, you have end of life of systems, you have people retire who knew what was important in something, and uh, you know, therefore the, the, the the, the, the behavior of what you're depending on can shift very radically very quickly. How do you mean? Well, if you are getting back reports which are reported as authentic. Yeah. So, and, 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 and things can be reported as authentic but are not authentic. Yeah. So, and, and, and it can be systematically it can be systematically made so that they look authentic. At other times, you know, it's obviously just rubbish. And that's great because you can deal with it. But also you, you have to... The other thing is that the, 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 problem, the problem is that you, your, your inference uh, and, and your, your understanding of the data has to be on the basis of and knowing that lots of it is wrong and missing as well. And... and uh, And, and, and that's the attitude. I mean, you know, the uh, statistician, if you look at this as a statistician, you'd just say, well, this is all rubbish, right? But it, it doesn't matter because, because it's, it's business useful. Uh, and so you can't, you can't say there's a statistical truth here. But there are no statistical truths, right? I mean, you know, what is... If it's grossly wrong, it's useful. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the other thing is complexity. Uh, I've talked about TV monitoring. This is an application we built about looking at the content on TV. Um, and the point I want to make here is uh, that the complexity of these um, architectures is very great. And uh, this is something in terms of the cost of doing infrastructure monitoring. Right? You, you don't have uh, very often the situation where you have uh, a, th a couple of easy points to tap the data out of the system. The reality is you, 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 you end up talking to uh, a, a spectrum of different devices which are reporting in different time frames in different ways. And, and that's just the reality of actually uh, doing uh, real life um, uh, infrastructure monitoring in our, in our experience. And this is another, another architecture. This is the broadband architecture cut a different way. Um, okay. so. The point I wanted to make about that is that we are, and, and I think I've said this already, we are, we are piggybacking on the applications. Okay? The things that drive the business cases in general are the applications. Because if you think about it, uh, you know, we get accolades if we can save, say, 2% on, on operating cost of something. That's fantastic. But we only get those accolades because um, it's seen as a bonus essentially. The, the real value for TV comes from getting subscribers, right? Uh, and and, and, and the, 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 the system is built in order to perform an application. Um, and again, if you're in a green, greenfield situation, you can engineer in all sorts of wonderful things when you're constructing the, 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 the system. But very often, we're in the situation of dealing with infrastructures where components have been reused multiple times. They've been repurposed, they've been extended, they've been refreshed, but they're not, they're not what you would build if you were building with a, with a, a huge budget and an eye to the future. You know, you're building to a business case here, and that's very restricting. And the other thing is, of course, now, uh, we, and, and it should have been for always, um, security and privacy trump everything and they slow everything down. And there's no way around this. And I think that this is, this is just um, uh, you know, a, a fact that uh, everybody has to build into their calculations um, 
you know, we have to anticipate these constraints and simply accept them and find ways to, to work around them. Uh, the final main issue I want to talk about is that things change. <coughs> and uh, it is a time of change, especially in telecoms. And I don't have any portentous music, you'll be glad to know. But um, it, things really are changing. I, I suppose it's the constant in life nowadays. But we're seeing uh, a scaling uh, challenge coming in. Uh, and there are some obvious drivers. So a lot more people are using our infrastructure uh, because there are a lot, a lot more people, right? <laughs> just a lot more people out there. Um, and uh, they're, they're richer, right? And they're doing more stuff. So, you know, the miracle of the late 20th century and the, the early 21st century, uh, hundreds of millions of people have been raised out of uh, appalling poverty. Uh, in Indonesia, India, and China, hundreds of millions of people uh, have emerged in, into the middle class. And uh, they want stuff, right? They want entertainment. They want to enjoy themselves. And they, they want to talk to each other. And they, they want to pass data around and do business and this kind of thing, right? So, you know, it's going to happen. Um, and this, this is an interesting problem. So just to give you a sense of the scale, in the UK, we run 30,000 base stations. Um, I think we're anticipating that's going to go up by at least an order of magnitude, maybe several orders of magnitude, uh, as we uh, provide, you know, really the future converged services. Um, and the, the future converged services are going to be pretty interesting because they're very heavily data dependent. We're talking about edge compute. We're talking about the network doing a lot more than it's done. We're seeing, obviously, lots of, uh, uh, of compute going into the network with the hyperscale providers. I'll talk about them in a minute. And, and this is going to create a, 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 big, a big step. We can argue about the number, but it's going to be a big step in the challenge of monitoring the network. There's just going to be so much more activity going on. We need that resolution. It is the rare events we've got to pick up. Those are the ones that, that, that determine the success of the service or not. Um, we need complete complete uh, vision over the, the, the network. We can't have a bit of the network we don't know about. We have to know about the whole lot. And we need to know, know it longitudinally. You know, we're not, we're not talking about something like the Large Hadron Collider where they can just find something interesting and throw everything else away and, and deal with that. No, we, we need a, a longitudinal record of how the network has behaved over time because that informs us about what it's going to do in the future. Um, and that, that is a problem. Uh, and at the same time, we have uh, some the, the increase in the actual complexity of what we're delivering and using to deliver it. And there are some interesting challenges here where uh, you know, we can't bring together uh, the whole picture at lightning speed, um, uh, you know, including how people are reacting to outages or reacting to changes in their service or how employees are managing new pieces of kit. Um, there is a, a difference in latency in terms of making up the pictures that, that, that the, the telemetry is, is being used to provide us with. Um, and, and this increased com complexity. And you put all this together and then you realize that we're small scale. Right. Uh, I went to a presentation a week ago, and I heard the man from China Mobile talk about their network. They have two orders of magnitude more. 3.3 million. 3.3 million. Yeah, sorry, I lo I, I've lost the M. It's missing. It's the pipe line. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's 4G, 5G. They're going to see the same scaling bump as us. That's a big bump, and uh, you know it's not just in terms of the connections. I was saying it's in terms of the services underneath there. We've got the hyperscale cloud providers; they're doing huge amounts of work. I, I saw Microsoft say they do 100,000 IP address resets uh, a, a minute. Right? Uh, that's a sustained rate of change in in their network at the minute. So there's this massive service challenge there. And also, we're in a situation where we're seeing discontinuous change. So again, back to the, the, the growth areas in the world. India, apparently, in 2016, was the 155th 
uh, country by per capita data consumption. Right? That's a believable statistic. You think about rural India, a uh, lot of poverty, loads of people, lot, lots of poverty, uh, big, big gap, right? Um, very difficult territory to deal with. Uh, can anybody guess where India is today in terms of per capita data consumption? That surprised me to my core. I was shocked. And, and I was utterly shocked in two years. And the reason is uh, that this company uh, called uh, Reliance Geo has appeared. And uh, they've spent $20 billion without seeing a profit. Right? They've simply picked up $20 billion and invested it in a mobile network in India. And, and they, they've not seen a penny, well, they've seen revenue back, but they have not seen a return on that at all to this point. And they basically, this investment uh, caused them to pull in 200 million 4G subscribers in two years. And this is one of the reasons I was shocked by this. Imagine onboarding 200 million people into your infrastructure in two years, right? That's, you know, four a second. This is, this is, I mean, that is a real discontinuity. That, that's something that I find really disturbing um, uh, in terms of, you know, imagine that you were looking at that data network and trying to work out what's going on. Imagine the, the change that they're experiencing in that situation. Well, it's government, it's the first thing. Yeah. <coughs> of course, everybody will be... No, it was not government. It, it was, was private yeah. company, so Reliance Geo. They went. They they just picked up twenty billion dollars from another business. Yeah, they also business as well. It might. If you would, would it, be smooth? it might. <laughs> I think. I think. I. I'd love to meet. I'd love to know. I think. I think this is a path to great riches. If you. If you know this stuff. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, the people who are doing it clearly they they know stuff I don't know. Uh, so that's good. And it's great for India. I mean, it's just absolutely astonishing. They've, they, they've got their own phone, the, the India phone, which is a data-capable smartphone uh, that they've given away. Uh, it's just amazing. So real change. OK, so why does it matter? Why does all this matter? Because this, this shift in scale uh, is, is really important because you know, monitoring is expensive in terms of especially power. Uh, and um, uh, 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 utilization, right? So it is using up the network, it's using up compute cycles, and most importantly, it is using up energy. And I think this is, this is the fundamental challenge here, which is, look, you know, we, we are now scaling our connectivity and compute infrastructure, my guess is several orders of magnitude. And it is going to happen because places like India are changing, right, a lot. And, and so, you know, standing in front of this and saying, oh, no, don't, it, you know, it won't happen. It is happening, right? And, and, and that's a problem because uh, we, the one thing we can't afford, $20 billion or not, is that we can't afford the environmental impact. And the way that things are run now at a small scale, perhaps it's tolerable, but we go through these orders of magnitude, and this is going to become a real, a real environmental problem. So if we can find ways of doing it contingently, efficiently, uh, low power consumption, um, you know, all of these considerations, that, this, that is going to be really important work, in my opinion. Um, you know, that will materially change how well, how well we can function as a society. So there we are. That's all I've got to say. And uh, thanks for the comments and the questions as we've gone along.